looking to give this talk. I, I just want to give a, a two-minute um, background on Jock Harmer. I think many of you know him, certainly us older fellows. Um, Jock, um, I see, also went to University of Natal, so we're balancing out that Rhodes dominance. Um, and then, so he did a, 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 his undergrad degree in an MSc in, in Natal at Durban and then did a PhD in Cape Town. After that, he spent time at the CSIR and then University of Pretoria. And then, like many of us, subsequently um, left academia mm -hmm. and ended up um, ended up as a as a independent working mm -hmm. in in the platinum industry. Interestingly, early on, and then more recently, oh. he's become involved, uh, particularly in the rare earth element business. And and I think some of his presentation today will cover a bit of that. Um, in terms of rare earths and carbonatites and, and the stuff that he's really interested in. So thanks, Jock. Um, we look forward to your presentation. Good luck. Thanks, John. Uh, and thanks for indulging me in, uh, in letting me in here as, a, as an Eastern Caper. Um, yeah, I just today I just want to uh, share some memories of um, working in Greenland. And um, um, I gave parts of this talk to sort of my exploration group. Um, just us in Africa, we, we, we tend to get used to being able to go going to the field, go back into the field whenever we want to. It might be messy, it might be muddy, it might be hot, but we can get there. Whereas Greenland is a very different situation. So first off, <clears throat> why Greenland? Why did I get involved there? Um, when I was exploration manager for African Platinum, sort of 2005, 2007, one of my responsibilities was looking around the world for alternative PGs. This was the time of the, um, of the PG boom. And um, met up with a, a group called Nuna Minerals of one of the PDACs. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of snake oil being sold in, in those days. And um, I quite liked what they had to say and uh, the way they were doing things. So I had that in my mind. Then FPAX was bought out by Impala in the beginning of 2007. And they approached me to join them to sort of sort out a whole bunch of the exploration assets that FPAX had. So that's when I started consulting. I didn't want to join a big, you know, big brother organization. And so I negotiated with them to, to consult for them. And um, when I joined, uh, when I started consulting, I increased the, um, the, expiration, the size of the exploration wing by 100 <laughs> percent, because Peter Harrison was the only other guy that was in there, and Peter and I were comparing notes about he had the same sort of thing around the world, and we both were quite in. He'd also picked up on this new mineral, so we uh, spoke to Les Payton, and we flew back, flew out there in 2007 to have a look and talk to the guys, and. We both then felt it was worth having a punt and we, we uh, got Impala to sign a, take out an option on some of their PG um, projects. So that's why Greenland. So let's just have a look at a couple of things. This, this, is, this graphic here just shows you sort of sitting on top of the world. Um, it's a big, big surface area with a very, very small population. Um, if you work out the population density, there's no problem with social distancing out there. Uh, the capital is Nook, I'll talk about that just now. And the first uh, European settler was Eric the Red in 990. Um, he settled there after being kicked out of Iceland. Um, and the people in Iceland were the Vikings that didn't get on with their, their, their colleagues in Norway. So this guy was probably obviously a bad dude. Um, and when he was expelled from, from um, Iceland, he sort of went around, found Greenland, and came back and gave the name, he, he called it Greenland. And a colleague of mine pointed out it was probably the first real estate fraud, because the, if you were expelled from Iceland, you could actually, if you could persuade other people to come with you, you could take them with you and you could settle. Um, and um, Eric the Red's son, Leif Erikson, was the first European supposedly according to the sagas that set foot in North America. Um, so Greenland's an autonomous territory within Denmark, within the, the Kingdom of Denmark, according to the, the Self-Government Act of 97. In 2008, they had a referendum to, to say, okay, do we support this or where do we want to go? And 
75% odd, odd of the population said, no, we wanted full uh, independence. And that was ratified by the Danish parliament. And so they're on a track to become fully economically independent from the, the, uh, Denmark. This is really important because they, 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 they um, identified mining as, a very, as, as one way of actually getting this economic um, independence. And so they're very, very pro mining. So um, just to put this, the size in context, it's sort of between the size of Saudi Arabia and DRC with their population, nothing like um, what we find in those countries. So they have a population of 56,000 that would fit into the Ellis Park Rugby Stadium and still leave a whole bunch of empty seats. Um, and with the, in context as well, when we went across there, Impala had more employees on staff than there was population in Greenland. So to get to Greenland, the easiest way is uh, an Air Greenland flight from Copenhagen. That takes you across Iceland, which is quite an interesting thing. You land in a, it's a converted old Air Force base of the, of the Americans uh, in Kangalusuak. And you, so you land, you go, you fly across in, in, in these big tours and then you get onto a little dash and fly down to the capital Nook. Uh, so when you, your first experience of what Greenland's all about is coming in over the East Coast, and this is what you see, and it's pretty intimidating. You can barely see where the ice flows on the, on the ocean stop and, and the land actually starts. And so well, how the hell do you do geology in a place like this? But this is three days later on the other coast, on West Greenland, this is what it looks like. So. The West, West Greenland is a completely different story to East Greenland. So that's a Google map of uh, Nook, the capital, as a population of about 17,600. That was back in 2017. There's approximately 45 kilometers of tarred road. And uh, that's probably more than half of the, the total uh, sort of roads in Greenland anyway. Um, so Nuna Minerals, the company we were there to think that the offices, their new offices were, the, which were built in about 2016, are there. And the other important part is the Gotthard Brew House down here, which nowadays would be called a craft brewery, but then it was just a brewery, a little restaurant place, did really good beer. And this is the muskox on their, uh, on their label, and they served really great muskox steaks. Okay, this is what it looks like in sort of midwinter when um, the lawyers finally got the option agreement sorted out. I had to go over and get all the data. I was there in February. Um, this is what it looks like from outside the, the offices. And this is what it looks like in the middle of July. So uh, much more balmy conditions and um, you know, a lot of, lot of um, outcrop to see in the summers. So infrastructure, I call it BYO, bring your own infrastructure. As I said, 40 Ks in, in Nook, probably less than 80 Ks throughout um, Greenland. Um, main access is via the, the coastline, the fjorded coastline, gives you a lot of access. And also the Greenland 4x4. And this is what it is. This is uh, inevitable if you're going to work there. And Nuna Minerals, um, had one of these on rental from Air Greenland for the entire summer with two pilots. And that was their main source of, of transport. So the field season, uh, all going well, is about four months long, from mid-May to about mid-September. If you're doing drilling, it's possibility, possible, there's a possibility of squeezing in an additional month either end of the season, depending on, on what the weather's like. And most of your access is using these uh, the, the big fjords there are navigable by freighters throughout the year. So that's on the west coast. So that's a, that's a really important uh, point. And um, there's this, in, on the Fiske Fjord, there's this um, quarry, a quarry, uh, pure olivine, which is used for, uh, smel for casting and stuff in Sweden. Um, and their very first, when they opened up, their very first shipment took place 15th of December, right middle of winter. You'll see here, it's, it's not iced up at all. This is the quarry and this is the, when we were then for 2007, a ship docking and, and being loaded. So um, this is your best way of access in there. Um, it's expensive. These are some old costs, but from around 2009. And so 
uh, their estimate of all-in drilling costs about 580 odd dollars a meter. Um, countering that, the, it's a, it's an incredible can-do society. It's 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 tough, it's rough, it's expensive, but just suck it up. Let's get on with it. Okay, so let's get on with looking at the the the, the um, PGE exploration we did there. Excuse this term, the platinum octopus. Um, I agreed to give a talk at Vitz. Judith Kinnaird then approached me in the middle of a first Thursday club after three or four beers and demanded a, a title. So I said the quest for the platinum octopus and um, sounds a bit punchy, um, but explain it a little bit uh, <laughs> in a bit more detail, justified, let's put it that way. So uh, Newnham Minerals had a large uh, licensed area, um, area under areas under license. Gold was their main target. They had a big gold project, uh, the PGE, and then later on they added rare earths and, and actual diamonds in. So quite a, quite a diverse um, company. Um, and what we're focusing on here are the PGE anomalies. They'd identify this in the Fisker Fjord area through very regional mapping and um, sampling in over 95 to 97. And so Fisker Fjord is, is this, looks like a big, it's a major fault that runs through you can see it's a big crack in here. This is the capital nook. You see these nice deep fjords here. And that's the Fiske Fjord running through there. Fis Fiske Fjord just means the fjord of fishes. Um, so this is more or less the, the target area. So this part of Greenland, there's nook there. There's a number of major terrains of different um, ages. And this is based on the Archaea terrain, which is the old Archean core terrain where the Amitsot gneisses and all of that occur. Um, the um, terrain here are sort of granite greenstones, metasedimentary gneisses, but they're big keels of metavolcanic amphibolites and also ultramafic intrusive complexes, some of them um, layered. And norites are conspicuous and local terminology they refer to the norite belt of intrusions that run down in this area here. Um, there's a recrystallized a re zircon data, 3 billion for this particular complex. So in other words, it's older than that. And these rocks here have all gone through granulite grade metamorphism. So here's a map of the area under license with the uh, different ultramafic bodies flagged. But what I want to point out to, and something that's also very different to working in my experience in Africa anyway, is you can see the, the detailed geology, the detailed base map, geological map, beautifully mapped, very, very well done by the Gaos guys, but no exploration being done on it. It's the sort of opposite to what we're used to in Africa. You know, we, we don't have maps. We go out and do the exploration, build our own map as we're going along. In uh, Greenland, you've got these beautiful Gaos maps. So these are just some of the different centers that they'd identified uh, with PG values. Um, this one in the middle here called Amikok. And the Impala option focused on um, the, um, Nuno were quite keen on us looking at all of these things, but uh, the, the argument was that uh, due to the distance to the closest smelter or whatever, to make this thing work, would it have to be a massive ore body? Um, the amphibolites at that stage were assumed to be the metagabroic part of this big layered complex. Um, some of the other ones had probably better initial results, but they decided to look, we, we'd focus on Amacock. So we signed the agreement, they signed an agreement, and we could start work in 2008. So why the platinum octopus story? This is the outline, the, the dark green rocks here are the amphibolites, and you can see the ultramafics in these purpley colors largely around the edges, okay? So if you look at that part of it, it looks just like a giraffe, you think? Okay, so a giraffe in Greenlandic is in Kunkakasuk, which uh, the um, Nuna Minerals guys thought investors would not get their tongue around. So if you change your perspective a little bit, and look at the bottom bit here, it looks just like an octopus or a squid. And that in Greenlandic is Amikok. So that's what we're looking at. Um, these were the results prior to us getting involved. There wasn't a lot of focused exploration. It was like just regional walk and grab type sampling, a large um, 
amount of the preliminary stuff done by the CEO himself. Um, and um, regional scale on soil sampling, um, and most of the sampling, as you can see, is concentrated on the edges of this body. So this is classic, you know, if you want to do some basic uh, uh, exploration, you start with soil, ge you know, stream ge geochemistry, soil geochemistry. <laughs> what soils? Um, it's, it's quite interesting when you get, when you get on the, onto the real, everything's outcrop. You know, why take the soil? You don't get the actual, um, the um, uh, regional coverage that you would with, ri with the rivers, because you can see there's no rivers here. So, um, you know, it, it was obvious that the first thing we had to do is get some real rock samples. So at the end of 2007, while we were waiting for the lawyers to get their act together, we scoped out some um, exploration that needed to be done of traverses across these bodies to, to be able to locate ourselves. And they, they got that completed late in the 2007 seven season. So that's, that's when we started up. So from those preliminary um, samplings, we subdivided the, the body into four um, focus areas, the giraffe's head, east neck, paradise valley, and south margin. These are nicknames given by the, the field crew. Uh, Nuno appointed a, a, a geologist as their chief geologist for this project, Paul Armitage. Paul cut his teeth on the Platte Reef, so he had experience. He did his PhD on the Platte Reef under Ian MacDonald. So he had some experience in, in these sorts of things. And um, so we focused on these to sample. And we did 20 meter space taking one kilogram composite samples in a series of traverses. Um, you know, 250 to 500 meters apart across each of the areas. And Paul is a um, habitual mapper, so he, he did the detailed mapping that accompanied the sampling. So that initial phase demonstrated that the amphibolites were not associated with the magmatic complex. They were, in fact, country rocks. And they established the sequence was mar marginal gneisses. This is from the base up. A zone of tectonized rocks, nucleonorites with phosphatic peroxonites, Hartsburgites, vanites, tectonized norites with the amphibolites being the roof. Um, so here's the detail of Paradise Valley, which was one of the major ones. These are the sample, sampling traverses made across in the, in the time. So here's some pictures. This is the outer contact, the Paradise Valley, the um, mafic, ultra mafics on the left. Um, and these are the, the, the outer contact area here. Um, this, the view you're looking at there, is these are probably 40, 40, 40 plus Ks away. Uh, because of the clarity of the air, the, you lose perspective a little bit. This is Paul Armitage, the geologist, standing on the, on the contact. These are the norites. Um, this is the mixed tectonized contact zone. Um, and if you go look at these things, this is the felspathic peroxonite. This sort of, um, say again, these rocks have gone through granulite grade metamorphism, but because low grade alterations in metamorphism, uh, uh, greenstone, uh, green schist metamorphism is largely a hydration thing. When, if you protect these against water getting in, you don't really change the minerals much. And so these are orthoperoxines, um, primary orthoperoxines within a cumulus plage out here. This is a poiclinic Hartsburgite. You could find a number of um, outcrops in the bush felt that would look exactly like that. These are cumulus olivines reacting with the magma to form the OPX, OIX, and whatnot. And these, you can see they wither out as little like um, egg-sized um, uh, nodules. Very, very characteristic and just like the bush felt material. This is the CEO, Uli, Uli um, Christensen. He's an MSc, Uppsala University in Geology. Uh, with Paul. One little chromite band they found, that's the only chromite in the area. Um, then the other contact down the bottom, the southern margin zone, these are the mafic, ultramafic rocks, these are the traverses that were put in. And this is the, one of Paul's detailed maps. Down here you find the, um, there's, these are the norites and the per, uh, norites, peroxonites and the ultramafics with the amphibolites on the roof. So this is what it looks like from the air. You can see here that these are the norites, the lighter rocks, and the Hartsburgites with these characteristic browning type of uh, colors. So um, here we have the, these banded um, phosphatic peroxonites. Uh, sorry, the norites, quite conspicuous color difference. 
And it's always standing next to these banded um, phosphatic peroxinites, very, very similar to the Bushveld uh, lower critical zone rocks. Um, this just shows this very well walked pathway here with very little population, 0 0.026 per square kilometers. How do you get these well walked? or pathways, well, these lads are running all over the show there. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of, of how things worked there. Between 19th of June, 16th of July, all those traverses were put in. A total of 896 samples were collected, and the PGA assay results we got back by the end of July, within a couple of weeks of the project ending. This is at a time, as I said, during the, the platinum boom, we, as I recall back when, we were waiting four to six weeks turnaround to get PG values back in. And yet, you know, we were able to work at that sort of turnaround. We dilocated some half gram to one gram per ton um, things. These are in situ. Um, and um, we saw that the norites were playing a role, very similar to the bushveld. We'd like to think about these things being ultramafics, but it's near where you get the uh, uh, Phage cumulus that you get the PGE. Interesting things, not associated with sulfur. We found very few sulfides at all around. Very high platinum palladium. This, the regional results showed high platinum. That was one of the, the attractions to us in Impala. Very low in gold. We'll see that in later. Okay, we followed on from that to doing, doing detailed channel sampling, um, actually cutting sword channels in the outcrop. And um, these were 20, 25 meters long and sampling down at about 50 centimeters uh, cuts. Um, so these are the technicians uh, with the cutting tool. This is not a particularly good outcrop area, but um, he, has a, he has a channel that's been marked out. We mark these things 20 Ks and these are the sampling markers on that. And he has a cut channel you'll see coming along this is Peter Brown, who took over as their senior geologist while we were working on that. So you can see there's a, a cut slot and you take really precise 50 centimeter sections across there. In all, that totaled up to about 1,100 channel samples, 10 different channels. And these were able to confirm the presence of um, uh, narrow reefs um, of uh, PG rich. Again, the grades were, were not uh, mega, about half to one gram per ton. Very high, consistently high platinum palladium. Um, so he has, um, he has some of these cut, uh, these are the channeled samples across the details. Here we have Hartsburgites, the norites, and these peroxinite layers in there. And the, you can see the hits are close to, they're in the norites close to where we see these peroxinite um, interfaces. Uh, Ian MacDonald from U U Cardiff got involved and did um, some intensive geochemistry. This showed these are the leuconorites ultramafix, and you'll see that the amphibolites are very, very different. And on the basis of that and the structural mapping that Paul did, it was quite clear that these were the roof. They're not associated with the late intrusion itself. When you look at the platinum group elements, you'll see one of the characteristics, very, very low gold. And in the uh, marginal zone, the southern margin zone, very, very high rhodium. And at that stage, rhodium was um, up in the, I think it was close to $10,000 an ounce. And so this created quite a bit of excitement um, sort of at the time. Okay, so just to summarize what we, what we accomplished there, one and two and a half thousand uh, scale mapping, we identified a mineralized PGE zone, and then channel sampled that down to almost, um, you know, uh, what you would do with a, with a drill hole within three and a half months, okay? And one of the, <coughs> just to put, summarize the reasons for that, um, having a ge geologist as a CEO helps a lot. And when I first met up with uh, Nuna, they had a little office in, uh, in the bottom of Nook, and at that stage they were expanding, they got a lot of investment and um, they uh, built new office block, a new office facility. Here are their new offices. And what Ule did was to keep the base, the bottom layer of the, the bottom floor of the, of the building. And he formed a company with the local municipality, um, raised money, set up a company to buy the assaying equipment. 
and he built an assay lab in the base of the building. Okay, independent company from from um, Nuna, but Nuna were a shareholder in it. Then got Act Labs in Canada, who were doing the assaying at the time, to run this laboratory independently as an independent contractor. So they sent uh, operators out from Canada. They set the thing up, got it accredited, and everything. And so we actually had a, a fire assay and fully fledged um, laboratory in the basement of, of the offices in Nook. So as we were in the field, the samples were helicoptered, choppered back to Nook. These guys did the analysis. And in some of the big regional sampling programs, we were getting the results back before we got to the end of the traverses, which helps a lot, as you can understand, in terms of um, progressing. Um, just before we leave, uh, this final slide will say, well, Sometimes it's not a good idea to have a CEO that's a geologist. Um, what happened then was the banking crisis hit at the end of 2007 and into 2008. Um, as a result, Impala sort of pulled out of any overseas operations. Um, the agreement with, with Nuna had a, a minimum spend clause. And so there was still more than half of that in the kitty. And so to close this down, Impala just said, well, do a drilling program. Good South African approach. Um, we weren't sort of ready for that yet, but you go ahead and do it. So 2019 was to do 600 meters of diamond core drilling. Uh, there were five holes in the um, Paradise Valley area and two in the southern margin. Um, the first hole we drilled, this was in um, Paradise Valley, uh, in this wall here. Um, was was the, uh, the, the you know this was the first hole in that area the the um, the drillers was Cartwright drilling from Newfoundland they were busy drilling one of the um, gold pro prospects it was about 49 48 49 kilometers as the crow flies away so they brought the rig across in um, in flights in pieces and then reassembled it on on site here. And this one here, these are the these are the these are the drilling rods coming in. There was a wind blowing, and as you came in, the things were spinning around. And when you're standing on the ground trying to control it, it gets a bit hairy. All he did was to back off, put them into the um, into an, a, a snow snowfield here, took away the angular velocity, picked it up and dropped, brought it in. These guys were were really pretty good. So this is the the rig assembled and and ready to drill. The geologists waiting for some action. Uh, so the results of that was they confirmed the persistence of these reefs at depth. The hope was that the grade would increase as you got into, you know, basin part or whatever. But it, it never, it never got much beyond one gram per ton. Um, and uh, so Impala pulled out of all their overseas operations. Uh, they regarded this as a, a sort of technical success, but we didn't go, you know, they didn't take it any further than that. The uh, interesting thing here is I found this old plot of mine. If you just look at, they found this, we had these high, high palladium, low palladium. Those days, palladium was a bad news. Now the values are not that different. Um, and you'll see that those channels mirror very much what we got out of the borehole. So quite an interesting approach to, to sampling in those um, setups. Um, all right, so how do you, how do you get, how do, can you get that type of quick turnover in a short time? Um, narrow uh, uh, field season, you lose days with weather. So your logistics are critical like when you, when you, um, you make the most of those, those um, months of clear weather. So this was the Nuna way. Um, so what they do, load up all the camping stuff and, and everything for a base camp from head office, take it on a barge. This is ahead of the season starting. Technicians and that go up and establish the camp. And so this is Kusuk Camp, there's a helipad, this is a lake, so this is the actual fjord, and this is a suspended, uh, elevated lake. And these are weather havens, uh, that's the main camp there, okay? And uh, so there you have um, kitchen mess stores. Uh, this is the accommodation for the pilots and the VIPs. Palazzo Pipi, that's the toilet, and the geologists live in the little these are their tents, okay? I was regarded as a VIP, luckily, because I was managing the stuff for, for the parlor. And uh, yeah, by the way, I was managing this, not doing the day-to-day -day stuff. I, would, I went through there for, for sort of week-long, uh, two-week-long trips. Paul was uh, doing most of the stuff. I think I had this little 
hut here. Uh, this is the little um, logging shed. Um, these were not our cause, these were uh, one of the other projects. Um, this was our splitting um, setup. We were isolated down away on the other side of the hill because you couldn't disturb the sleep of the pilots. They had two pilots and they worked continual shifts. Um, they drilled through the night as well here. Okay, so at the end of that, um, that season, they had a, uh, a sort of wrap up session with the geos and um, talking through in all their licenses, they had just taken out licenses for diamonds um, further north than, than, than uh, where we were working. And I noticed on one of them that they had, there was a, a carbonatite. And um, so I, um, I actually, you know, inquired because at that stage I, I was busy with a company setting up and looking for rare earth projects in Africa. Um, and um, they, I was able to fly, they flew me up onto the, the carbonatite and right at the end of the season in September 2009. And uh, I was able to get two and a half hours on this, this particular complex. Uh, that was just because weather constraints. Uh, we waited like two or three days to get a helicopter <laughs> that conditions to get up there. And, um, there was a very detailed a PhD uh, Geos memoir by this guy Knutsen, so I knew what to look for. Took a bunch of samples, two of them were fairly high rare earths. And so on the, on the strength of that, um, they asked me to submit a proposal for a proper exploration study, which I did. And then I designed and managed an exploration program on uh, this carbonatite in uh, 2010. Um, in between this and getting there, they'd found a second, they had a license, another carbonatite, one of the other licenses. So in 2010, went out and actually did the, um, some exploration on, you know, for rare earths. So just to kind of keep up with this fancy titles, rummaging for rare earths. So here's the west coast of, of Greenland. Um, there's Nook as a marker. And these are the um, ultramafic, kimberlites and kimberlite-like ultramafics, lamprophytes and kimberlites, these red dots. And there's a bunch of carbonatites coming through. And there's this one here is Kakasuk. And down here is Tukiyosak. These were both under license to Nuna. This one up here, Sofotok, is a fairly well-known carbonatite. There's a company called Hudson Bay who were exploring for diamonds up here. The diamond industry wasn't all that good. John will tell us more about it next week, I believe. Um, and so Hudson Bay redesigned themselves as a rare earth company. Spent quite a bit of time talking to us and not getting some tips. Uh, but they, I'm not sure, I think they still have that project. Anyway, so the two we're looking at is Kakasuk there and Tikiusak. And here's a, a, a map from uh, Sebastian Tapper and all who did the first uh, write up on Tikiusak. You'll see that there are three provinces here, different ages. The Suffolk area, they're sort of 600, 500 million year old. Tikiusak is young, it's sort of like Karoo aged. And then down south is the, is the better known Garda province with lots of uh, alkali silicates and, and carbonatites in there. So these are two different ages, but in the same sort of general area. Um, so just to highlight those two. Um, Tikiosak was only discovered in 2005 by Gale, so we were there in 2010, quite exciting to be in there. Uh, it was written up in 2006, it's 157 years and quite detailed geochemistry, not so much geology, but de detailed chemistry including isotopes and all sorts of fancy things in this report up in 2009. But we are the first exploration to be done on there. So this is the, the discovery type geophysics. They had this anomaly along with um, stream sediment sampling anomalies and they, they, that they used to, to trace. They went back in and um, this, this is the um, uh, Aramag anomaly here. So they defined uh, what they call the, the complex. Um, the, that's the Aramag anomaly with a core area in the middle. And then this is they've got out here is the, um, the extent of the influence of the carbonatite. Um, it's not the carbonatite itself. So that core zone is, this is what it looks like here. And there's very little outcrop or no outcrop. And you're right on the edge of the inland glacier. So this is the edge of the ice cap. Um, so there's no, nothing out that way. 
So when we were traversing down, we found there was no very little outcrop here. There was a, a very thin veneer of, of till, only about a meter thick, but it was enough to mask what was underneath. So we were limited to sampling in these gullies. And what we found was that rather than a big plug of carbonatite, these were a lot of, these were sheets. So these uh, brownish color thing here are intrusive sheets of carbonatite cutting into the gneisses. So overall, we estimated probably no more than 10 to 15% of that area that created the magnetic anomaly was actually carbonatitic. These were narrow sheets like this. Um, uh, the Nuno um, consultant geophysicist did some workups to look at for texture in the, in the, in the mag. And you'll see here this um, upwardly continued modeling. You see these very nice indications. It looks like a, 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 pen, a sort of a, a digestive system, but they're like um, swarms of like arcuate carbonatite or dikes of some sort. And that's exactly what we saw in these uh, gullies that we, that we logged. And so you'll see here's the intrusive carbonatites intruding into these um, nices. You'll see the nices, nices are blackening a little bit alongside the contact. That's alkali metasomatism or phenotization, which is a very good characteristic of carbonatites. Um, these were calcite rich, not magnetite calcite carbonatites, which in, in uh, the gospel, according to me, <laughs> has fairly low prospectivity. They're not ideal things to, uh, to chase up. You wouldn't target these. And the uh, assays we got back um, proved that. So these were the samples we took initially that went off, that batch went off. And when we got the results back, they weren't encouraging at all. Um, we were only here for about 10 days. So we got the results back while we were in the field. And um, uh, actually, in fact, we didn't, we, we sampled those. And then we said, well, look, I don't think those are going to carry anything. We went back to the mag, well, not the mag, but the radiometrics. And here's the core, that carbonatite core on the map. Um, and there was a high thorium kick just outside of this core area. So we went to investigate to see what we could find up here, those two things, and found this rock that looks very coarse grained. Um, and just the texture is very, very similar to um, pigmentoidal type stuff that we found, that I'd seen in, in East Africa that were rare earth mineralized. So we thought, look, this looks much better candidate. Submit these as well. And uh, these are the samples we took. And you can see we got well over, you know, 1% to 1 to 3% in all of these, just based on that uh, tech, um, on the textures, it was quite nice. These results came back afterwards. So it, it, um, that was really interesting. The main focus of our attention was this complex called Kakasuk, which has a bit of an identity problem. The Gaos, the survey called Kakasuk, and that's in all the literature and everything, but uh, Ule, the CEO, very proud Greenlander, um, said they got it wrong. This name of this area here is, is uh, Kakatasak, which basically means the place that stays green. And it's, it's historically well known through the ages because, because it stays green, the reindeer concentrate here. So it's a major sort of hunting site. And so the, the company called the project Kakatasak, the proper one. So it's got this conspicuous, slightly green color. So this is the carbonatite in here. And this lake we call it um, Oxbow Lake. So there, Knudsen had done a, his PhD and uh, published a memoir on it. Again, it's not a plug. These black things here are the carbonatites. So a series of concentric carbonatite sheets around a core with, um, the, he also describes peroxonites, glimmerites. And these glimmerites are nothing more than the uh, phenotized um, country rocks with the development of phlogopite. Uh, so very little um, uh, actual carbonatite. But he did a detailed petrological study and, and he highlighted these so-called lanthanide rich uh, calcite dolomites. And these were the things that I actually sampled in my initial exploratory trip that had the, the high grades. These are fairly smallish dikes. So the, the, the trick here was to find, uh, see how many we could find, see how if we could find any bigger ones, what would the likely tonnage be? They would probably have the grade, but would they actually have the tonnage? And so this is an area here, that's where, our, that's our camp. So there, 
you know, there was uh, myself, Paul, and two Cardiff students that were with us. Um, and down here, you can see there's um, a few little huts there. Those are abandoned um, Gaos, derelict Gaos um, uh, accommodation from when they were doing the mapping. And those have been used through the years by fishermen coming to thing here and there. The students found some rather interesting uh, Scandinavian uh, magazines in there, which they were very, very pleased about. Uh, I'll say no more. Um, uh, this is, we were, you know, we're just tenting out there and we'd supply, get um, um, provisions flown in every four or five days. Uh, one of the students took this picture and, and it, it's quite funny. It looks like I'm a bit concerned about this guy crashing and I was just holding my hat on really. Um, uh, this was the uh, mess tent. Um, I, after we all had a go, they all decided that I cooked the best. So it became, I, I, would, I did the cooking, they did the, the coffee and the washing up. So they called it Jock's Bistro. Um, these are what these little dike things look like. They're small, that's a, that is a smallish one, but they're quite, these are all nices, um, very uh, conspicuous. And when you look at them again, you've got this pigmentoidal um, uh, texture. Um, let me get too technical, but these are normally uh, relics after Burbankite, which is an alkali uh, rare earth carbonate. Um, and you'll just notice here, I'm just highlighting the fact that everyone's got the bags on their head. This is me taking a sample. You'll see that I've got my pants all tied up and a bag over my head. And that's to get rid of um, mosquitoes and, and black fly. And this is the, the cap they gave us. This is the Nuna Minerals cap. And at the front show, if you clip it on, there's a built-in net vest that you can keep the flies off. One of the interesting things you discovered working in the field there is that you can walk faster than a, like a Curtisac mosquito. So when you're traversing, these are a pain in the butt to have, or a pain on the head to have uh, when you're walking around. Um, so you walk along and all you read, okay, the mosquitoes have left us, you take it off, you chat away. When you stop at a rock and start talking, uh, within about five seconds, the mosquitoes catch up with you. Um, so we sampled, did a, quite a lot of sampling. We picked up as many of these little dikelets, trenched a whole lot of them. And these were the results, uh, both the trenches and the outcrops um, gave us quite good values. Um, anything, say, a, a one and a half percent would be regarded as probably as grade. So we, um, this was really encouraging for um, these initial studies. Okay, so that's what we wrapped up. So essentially what happened next, um, on the basis of that, I. Um, I, at the time, I'd set up a little company trying to find uh, rare earth assets and my co-investors in that said, okay, boys, that's enough playing around. You've got to focus on, on getting this company going, which we, and we reversed the things into an Aussie listed company in, in, in 2011. So I was out of the game. Paul and the other guys went back in. They did um, a lot, quite a bit of drilling to, you know, 2000 meters uh, on both Tikiusak, that didn't go very far, but focused on, on Kokodasak. And on the strength of that, they actually signed a, an earning agreement with Corez, the Korean Resources Corp, who were looking for um, rare earth assets. They, they um, signed a similar one with um, Frontier on uh, Suncorp Strip in the Cape. Um, and they, they, they drilled again another 2,000 meters in 2014. Um, then, unfortunately, the, the wheels came off um, and Nuna Minerals were a bit too widely spread. Their principal investor was the, the, the government of Greenland. Uh, the, they wanted to sell their, sell their shares and get out of that. And so they spent a couple of years trying to get investors to, to buy in. That um, failed and in the end, they had to file for bankruptcy uh, in 2016. So they essentially closed their doors in uh, 2016, which was really sad. And I, I gather that all the licenses are actually um, now back on back in play. So that's it. It's a site from just north of Tukiusak looking down into the, uh, the local fjord. Great. Any, are you going to process questions? Thanks, Jock. Yeah. Lots of questions.
I'll just get the ball rolling, Jocko. It's quite interesting to see those three different ages of your um, alkaline rocks and kimberlites, uh, which fit sort of the the, the protozoic cullinan, the 600, 500 million year old Phoenicia, if you're looking locally, and then obviously, you know, the younger, younger um, crew, not crew, um, what's it, Jurassic, um, Cretaceous, Kimberlites and alkalic rocks. Yeah. yeah. Now, it was and, interesting and, in 2010 being there because they had, um, um, I can't remember his name now, Hutchinson. They had a guy who was like the doing the focusing on the on the um, Kimberlite stuff, and in, in Tikiosak, there are a lot of these alakite dikes, you know, cutting through uh, or near the complex, and um, um, it was quite interesting to see, you know, they doing the indicator mineral things were all giving really nice vectors, but they all vector into the middle of the glacier. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and again, just for interest, I mean, Larson and Sebastian Tapper have done some good work um, on those, I think, particularly the Kimberlites and the ages. Sebastian obviously is is a lecturer at UJ yep. Yep. and Kate, Katie Smart's husband, who Katie's at bits of it. All right, questions? Uh, Natalie has got her hand up. Guys, you can put on your video so that we can see you again. Natalie, go ahead. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, maybe slightly off topic, but I just wanted to know if you'd noticed any, if there'd been a noticeable um, shift in the field seasons due to any sort of climate change or anything like that. Longer field seasons or anything to that effect. I haven't, haven't heard any reports of that. Um, it's quite interesting with the global warming story. Um, yeah. uh, to the Greenlanders, they think this is the greatest thing, you know, because they're getting more and more land, land that's coming out. Yeah. And you hear all these, you know, the, which are serious, the, the reports of the glaciers melting and stuff like that, that uh, the Greenlanders think this is great. They're getting more country. Yeah, um, I mean, it's the, same in, yeah. it's the same in Canada, they say. Um, we'll be able to open up more exploration possibilities there, but I'm not sure yet. Yeah, I haven't I haven't had a lot of contact with with the guys, you know, subsequently, unfortunately. But um, um, I, I I would suspect it wouldn't be a major change, it, you know, probably because mm. uh, when those things shift, you often find you get stormy a bit, so you get you know you yeah. get into that bad area where you get lots of rain rather than snow and, and clear areas and stuff. Sure, thanks. Yeah, it's just very interesting. It uh, sounds like a really cool place to work. <laughs> oh, excellent. It's fantastic. And they really um, want, it, it's what it was an amazing change for us, you know, they want you to be there. So when, when yeah. we arrived there to go and get all the stuff thing for Impala, it was a, like a demand from the local minerals, the thing where that we need to go down and see them. And we went down there and, you know, they don't say, well, hey, you know, you've got to do this and do that. The first thing they say is, you know, You've come to the right place. You know, so <laughs> yeah, this is the good thing, sure. and they want you to be there. It's got to change. <laughs> Thanks. John Trustwell, uh, you've got a question? But he's still muted, isn't he, um, Penny? Just uh, uh, hold down your uh, space bar, John, and then we can hear you. And then after that, we'll hear what Elaine has to say. Okay, Elaine, maybe you want to take the question so long? Speak to us, Elaine. You're just unmuted now. John, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Hi, John. Hi. Um, this is a bit of a trip down uh, memory lane, but when I joined WITS very many years ago, at the same time did John Ferguson. And yep. John had worked previously with the Danes in, in Greenland. And uh, he and I actually both went to Australia about the same time and worked in then Bureau of Mineral Resources. He went off into mineral exploration, setting up companies and getting funds over uh, a, a long period of time. And I remember him saying that he had, well, he worked in then in Australia and Canada and Greenland and, and saying that he had been in Greenland every year for 30 years and had been given a gong 
for his uh, efforts in relation to exploration in Greenland. I'm, I'm sure it's, it's a chap Jock you will have come across in your in your uh, in your workings and perhaps more recently. Yeah, in a way, he was instrumental in me getting involved with alkaline rocks and carbonatites. We, when I was we're doing some doing isotope work in, at BPI, he was just sort of leaving bits and. Grant and Spike McCarthy and John Ferguson got hold of me and tried to persuade me to do a PhD on, on the pylons, but it sounded like a damn good idea. So when I applied for exemption or postponement of my military service, they sent me my call-up papers. And I decided, well, what the hell, let's go and do it and get it out the way. And when I ended up in the CSR and doing some in the lab there, I thought, well, okay, what should I start? What can we look at? And we went and did the Leofontaine complex just north of Pretoria, dated it and did some chemistry on it. And, and you know it carried on from there so um, now i remember john um very very well that would have been 70 76 77 77 i suppose 77 78. thank you john malang you've got a question for jock yes jock uh, just a quick one and that's to do with maybe remote sensing wasn't needed because the outcrops were so good etc However, um, my ears pricked when you mentioned potential field, in this sense, magnetic data. Um, how, was that acquired specifically for this project? And how is it acquired? Um, is it airborne or is it field data? Just a bit of insight into that would help. Magnetic yeah, it was, it, it was air, airborne. The, the, the Tikiosak one and the, 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 those were um, regional surveys that, that, le that led to the discovery of it. Carbonatites, particularly the early stage calcite ones, the high temporary ones, have lots of magnetite in them, so they tend to respond really well to these. So you get these these fairly good patterns on it. Um, they then, I think, um, might I, I don't regard I don't recall whether they actually reflew it at a, at a higher resolution stuff, but um, it was airborne. And that's another thing in Greenland. There's just so much information around that you can get. You know, they 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 throw at you. It's not stuff you have to go to the survey and fight them and try and you know, to pay them you know, huge amounts to get out of it. Thank you. Jock, I see uh, you did a, a bit of sub-horizontal drilling there, very effective way, a good return on your core, whereas when you drill vertically, you know, get a very small, very small section. Uh, were you able to control your direction over and over what distance did you do that? Uh, you know, how well did you control that? Yeah, these these were shortish holes. They weren't you know, much more than 60 to 80 meters, 60 to 100 meters, uh, as I recall. Um, and um, the drillers were a group called Cartwright Drilling um, from they were New from Newfoundland, Canada, and they used them for all the drilling. In fact, Paul uh, ended up moving across to do some work with them. Kango, who have a project in Malawi, and they ended up using them as well, you know, because local guys were having problems drilling in some of the material. Um, so they did all the downhole surveying and there was not much of a problem. The grain, the foliation there was, you know, sub-vertical. So, you know, there's no point in drilling. Um, you had to drill sub-horizontal, you know. I don't know if you ever experienced Newfoundland drillers. It's, um, they speak something, but they say it's English, but it's impossible to <laughs> understand what they're up to. I spoke to a, co a Canadian colleague and she said that, you know, well, if they ever have interview a Newfoundland uh, on Canadian television, they have subtitles. You know, <laughs> people know what they're talking about. Quite sign language. <laughs> Real characters. Yeah. Anybody more for questions? Thanks, Jock. That, okay. was, that, was, that was really good and interesting. So I really appreciate that. Henny, did you get it taped? Yes, it's taped. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm about well to, to shut down the air. So it's available for you guys for the next 10 days or so. If you want to refer anybody to listen to it. Thank you very much, Jock. I really enjoyed listening to that. No, that's yeah, a pleasure. Thanks, thanks for... And, and just wanted to say welcome and thanks to all the new members. There are quite a few new names on, on the list there. So fantastic. We really appreciate your presence and if you've got any good ideas for for speeches or, or, or talks or presentations please let us know thanks thanks Henny thanks for running the show again that was good thanks Joe what's yeah. coming up next week John 
Um, so next Bristol week, fellows, huh? yeah, I'm going to talk about diamonds, those important oh. minerals, particularly the pretty, oh. particularly the pretty colored ones. Here. Okay, we're back on to diamonds, guys. Looking forward to seeing you next week. Have a good one then. Bye bye there. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, John. Thank you very yeah. much, John. Pleasure.